Hello students, today we are going to uh, deal with the transportation in plants. Uh, our planet Earth is composed of the biotic and environmental components. Composed of the biotic and abiotic components. Biotic components being the plants, animals, and it composes. The body weight of the biotic components is majorly occupied by water, which accounts to 85% to 95% of their body weight, and water being the abiotic component of it. So, plants absorb water through the roots from the respective habitats that is either the soil or the water. So, the root hair is helping absorption of water and the water that is absorbed from the root hair is transported to all parts of the plant body. This transport to all parts of the plant body against the gravitational pull that is the movement of water here is seen as negatively geotrophic movement of water near movement of water which is described as ascent of sap sap means water with dissolved minerals The large amount of water is absorbed by the root hairs and is transported to various parts of the plant body and you will be surprised to know that only less than 1% of water is used for its metabolic activities such as growth, reproduction, storage, etc. And the remaining water, remaining uh, water is lost from the plant parts through transpiration. That is, loss of water in the form of water vapor through the stomata present in the leaves is defined as transpiration. The excess amount of water is utilized by the plant body in cooling the parts of the plant. So, that is the importance of uh, water uh, playing a uh, major role in the living organisms. And water from the root case it has to be transported to various parts of the plant body, crossing the biological membranes. So today's in this session we are going to learn about how water gets transported from one cell to another cell inside the plant body, and what are the processes that are involved in it, and if you see the agenda, we are going to deal with the diffusion, the types of process, the osmosis and the difference between the diffusion and osmosis as well and the permeability, the types of solutions that are seen inside the plant cells as well as the types of plasmolysis, uh, plasmol imbibition, lactation, absorption of water and its pathways through which it reaches, it moves from one cell to another cell. So the first process is diffusion. Diffusion is treated as the movement of molecules, movement of solvent molecules from the region of higher concentration to the region of lower concentration, from higher concentration to lower concentration. Movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration is defined as diffusion. Diffusion necessarily does not need any membranes, does not need any membranes, it works with membranes or without membranes. So, uh, this is one important process which we see in nature everywhere, even outside the atmosphere. Even like we have, we can take a best example of uh, applying scent on our body, the scented molecules, the solute molecules will be near to our body in large quantities and slowly they try to spread from this area to the whole room. 
That means from a higher concentration to a region of lower concentration, we have to equalize the concentration. That is, the process, the end uh, result of this process is to maintain equilibrium across the membranes. So the next process is uh, osmosis. Osmosis is movement of uh, solute particles from a region of uh, uh, low uh, solute concentration to a region of high solute concentration. In other terms, you can say it is movement of water from higher uh, water concentration to a region of lower water concentration. In this slide, you can observe that the uh, movement of molecules are our movement of molecules is going through region of uh, lower concentration to region of higher concentration across the membrane. That is the main difference between diffusion and osmosis. Osmosis happens across the biological membranes. Across biological membranes. And the movement of molecules across the biological membranes needs a lot of energy. So, it, osmosis is an energy consuming process, wherein, in contrast, diffusion is a not an energy consuming process. Let us try to differentiate between diffusion and osmosis. Differences between diffusion and osmosis. Movement of molecules from a higher concentration to a lower concentration is defined as uh, diffusion. In contrast, osmosis, movement of molecules from lower concentration to higher concentration. Next, it also can be defined as movement of molecules from lower concentration to higher concentration with respect to solvent. In contrast, you can say the movement of molecules from higher concentration to lower concentration with respect to the solvent. Then, the, here uh, in diffusion, we can say diffusion works on concentration gradient. Diffusion works on concentration gradient, whereas osmosis is irrespective of concentration gradient. Works on irrespective of concentration gradient. Diffusion moment of molecules, irrespective of the absence of biological membranes, is seen in diffusion, whereas in osmosis, crossing the molecules across the biological membranes is essential. Then the kinetic movement of the molecules require no energy. While moving through, and it, this type of movement is called as a passive movement, and the kinetic energy of the molecules in osmosis is referred to as the uh, active movement of molecules, which requires energy. And it is observed in gases, liquids, and solids, whereas osmosis occurs in liquids crossing the membrane. These are the major differences that you can observe in the between diffusion and osmosis. There is one similarity between diffusion and osmosis. Both these process helps in maintaining osmotic balance or you can say equilibrium in the respective areas where they are performed. The main motto of diffusion and osmosis is to maintain the equilibrium in the living systems. <coughs> the next concept that we are going to deal with is the permeability. When we understand that the molecules tra are transferred across the membranes, then whether we, it is essential to know that whether these, small, these membranes are really allowing them to pass through them, allowing these molecules to pass through them or not. That is defined as permeability. Permeability refers to a degree to which the membrane permits the movement of gases, liquids and dissolved substances. 
Permeability of proctoplastic membranes depends on the kind and variety of its constituents such as state of aggregation, fluidity, thickness and degree of hydration. Next. So the, what, based on the permeability membranes are of the following types. Impermeable. Impermeable membranes are membranes which do not allow to pass any of the substances through them and the examples are heavy cutinalist and sugarized cell walls. You know the cell walls are made up of different kinds of substances. They are made up of cellulose, lignin, pectin, suberin, and hemicellulose. These are the various components with which the cell walls are made up of. And these different kinds of uh, cell walls with different kinds of uh, the materials which they are formed is formed in various areas of the plant body. So the uh, cell walls which are made up of uh, cutin and suberin are totally impermeable for the transportation of any substances to them. The next condition is permeability. Permeability. Permeability is, uh, it allows a diffusion, it allows a diffusion of uh, the substances, the solvent molecules across the membranes, allows movement of solvent molecules across the membranes. That means water being the major solvent, the, uh, it helps in movement of water molecules across the membranes and it is treated as the permeability of the substance. Then the next one is Differentially permeable. Or you can say semi permeable. Here the cell wall has a lot of choices. It will allow only those solutes and the solvents which are required for its metabolic activities. And so it is very choosy in this area, like it will choose and allow only the movement of those molecules and that condition is defined as differentially permeable or semi-permeable membranes. So all biological membranes, most of them will be either permeable or semi-permeable, differentially or semi-permeable membranes. The change in the permeability depends upon the natural, chemical or changes in the environment. These three things may affect the permeability of the substances in across the biological membranes. The next concept that we are going to deal with is the types of solutions. When we understood about the uh, cell, uh, like uh, the uh, biological membranes, and let us see what are different types of solutions depending on the concentration of the solutes that are present. Based on the concentration of the solute, concentration of solute, solutions are of three types. Hypertonic solution. Hypertonic solution is the one which contains higher concentration of solutes when compared with its surrounding medium. So, greater concentration of solutes. If the greater concentration of solute means that it is a concentrated solution. You know the solution contains the solute and the solvent. And if the concentration of solute is more in number, it is treated as a concentrated solution. So, hypertonic solution is a concentrated solution. Then you have isotonic solution. It 
if the concentration of this solution is equal to the concentration of its surrounding medium, so equal in concentration. And the third word type is hypotonic solution. Wherein the concentration of solute is less than the uh, surrounding area, and so it is called as a dilute solution. So after having, after understanding about the hypotonic and isotonic and hypotonic solutions, let us see how the animal cell and the plant cell behave. When these cells are kept in these different types of solutions, what happens to the cells in these three different conditions? When the animal cell, and the basic difference between the animal cell and plant cell is that the plant cell is protected by the cell wall. Because cell wall plays a major role when the cells are kept in the different types of solutions. Let us see how do these animal cells and plant cells behave. When, the, when both of them are kept in hypertonic solution, This is hypertonic solution when compared to the protoplasm of the cell. So the concentration around the cell is at higher concentration when you compare with the protoplasm of the cell. So the water tends to move outside the cell membrane. Resulting in the shrinking of the cells. <coughs> when this when the plant cell is kept in a hypertonic solution, the plant cell also shrinks slowly and it tries this uh, protoplasm present inside the cell, it tries to detach from the cell wall and finally it gets shrink. Then if the plant, if, the, if these cells are present in isotonic solution, if they are present in isotonic solution, the net movement of molecules which are found moving inside and outside is zero. The net movement of molecules is zero. Is zero and so there is no change in the size and shape of the cells. They remain constant in the uh, isotonic solutions. And if the cells are placed in hypotonic solution, solution then the, there is movement of water inside the cell the water excess water moves inside the cell here we are dealing about the uh, osmosis and so there is movement of molecules from a lower concentration to the higher concentration so the water enters into the cell and the cell 
because it is lined with only plasma membrane, it tries to bulge and then it bursts. Animal cell bursts in a hypotonic solution. Whereas when the what when the when there is movement of water inside the plant cell, the plant cell also swells in size. And the cell wall offers the resistance, offers fragility to the cell. So, this be, because of finding of the cell wall, it maintains fragility, and the cell is full with the uh, uh, volume of uh, substances. And it does not burst as seen in the animal cell. So, in this way, the plant cell and animal cell behave in these three types of solutions. Next, coming to coming to plasmolysis. What is plasmolysis? These are the various conditions. Now, we are going to deal with the various conditions like the uh, uh, when the moment of molecules move inside the living systems, what are the various conditions that we see? The first condition is plasmolysis. Lysis means breakdown. So let us see what is that that is breaking down here. When this plant cell is kept in a hypertonic solution, Exosmosis takes place. Exosmosis takes place. In hypertonic solution. That so means water from the cell is passes out of the Passes out into the surrounding medium, passes out into the surrounding medium, which is defined as exosmosis. So the beginning stage, the first, the first stage of uh, uh, the plant cell, where it starts uh, sending away the water from the cell, is defined as the first stage of it is defined as incipient. Incipient plasmolysis, where the protoplasm is broken down, and in the second stage, where the plant, the protoplasm gets completely detached from the uh, cell wall, and you can see it becomes. If uh, protoplasm is seen in a circular shape inside the plant cell, and this stage is called as evident plasmolysis. So, plasmolysis occurs in two stages when the plant cell is kept in a hypertonic solution. So, the process, what happens here? The process, the exosmosis process takes place. Exosmosis is X is coming out of the uh, plant, water coming out of the plant cell, resulting in the shrinkage of the protoplasm. So, the first stage here is called as incipient plasmolysis, where you can see the protoplasm starts shrinking, starts moving away from the cell wall. That is the first stage. And the second stage, where the water is totally uh, taken out of the plant body, uh, plant cell, then you can see the protoplasm gets uh, rounded up at the center, okay, and uh, losing its original size, shape, and volume of the cell, and that condition is called as evident plasmolysis. Well, in this case, in uh, in this second situation, if you if we can allow, if we keep the plant cell inside of Inside, uh, if we keep the plant cell in an isotonic solution or in a hypertonic solution, then 
The plant cell will try to absorb water and can it, it can regain its original size, shape, and the pressure it has to maintain in the inside the cell. So plasmolysis can be brought back. It's a reversible process to some extent. If plasmolysis continues for a longer time, it results in death of the cell. So plasmolysis can be regained to some extent. It can be regained on keeping the cell in a hypotonic solution where it gets water. So that condition is called as imbibition. So the next process that we are going to deal is imbibition. So now we have learned that exosmosis has taken place and the protoplasm has shrinked and has uh, come to the center of the cell and when it is kept in a hypotonic solution when it is kept in a hypotonic solution so water enters into the cell So this process is called as endosmosis. So endosmosis will help to regain the original size and shape shape of protoplasm. This this process is defined as imbibition. So in imbibition, endosmosis takes place, resulting in gaining the original size. And this process is generally seen in our day-to-day -day life also. We try to soak the seeds in water. So when you place the seeds in water, you can see after, after a particular period of time, the seeds will swell in size and that process is defined as imbibition. Okay, so then the next process is gravitation. Gravitation is loss of water in the liquid state in the form in the uninjured parts of the plant. That means, like you can see this condition during the winter season. You can see so the loss of water from the uninjured parts of the plant body is defined as gravitation. That means you can see the small droplets of water which are seen on the plant parts during early hours of uh, winter days or during late hours of winter. Is. You can observe the water droplets seen on the surfaces. So this, which is which we call it as dew. Okay. This is due to the process called as gravitation, which is loss of water. And this process is seen during the uh, early. Uh, uh, day and uh, during the late nights during the winter season and <coughs> so if water is, if water is forced to come out of the cell because this is the end places of the xylem elements where the transformation of water takes place so the uh, the water is forced to come out of the uh, uninjured parts of the uh, leaves and this condition is called, this is called as hydrothos. What Water is seen, water exudes out from the leaf parts and which is called as a hydrothos. It can be disturbed, hydrothos can be disturbed as an opening or a pore in the leaf epidermal cells which is uh, which are like a, a made up of the parent and the cells. Mm -hmm. okay. So now we are going to 
understandable how water gets absorbed through the root hairs in the root system. If you observe the root system, the mother root, the main root, the root hair, the lateral roots, and the lateral roots contains the root hairs. So, in this uh, root hair zone, uh, the root hairs, they are made, the cells of the root hairs are made up of pectin and cellulose. Cell walls are formed. And these are uh, hydrophilic in nature. Hydrophilic in nature. You know, hydrophilic is uh, having more adherence to water, is hydrophilic in nature. So, because of trends of this pectin, pectin and cellulose, in the cell walls of the root case, I have seen uh, greater absorption of water from the root case. So, uh, and also because of trends of pectin, it, uh, the pectin adheres or it's uh, uh, a good substance which helps in adhering the soil particles. So the roots, the root heads cling to the soil particles and that facilitates a better absorption of water from the root heads. And you know, the root heads, the, the absorption of water increases from 3 fourths to 10 fourths the absorption of water from the root heads is facilitated to 3 times to 10 times. So that is the capacity of the absorption of water to the root heads. Now you might, you under, you might have understood that the importance of the root hairs in the root systems. What is the importance of the root hairs in the root systems? The importance is that they are made up of pectin and cellulosic cell walls which are hydrophilic in nature and have quick absorption of water uh, from the soil or the surrounding water. And because of the pectin, uh, pectin in the, cell, in the cell walls, it adheres to the soil particles firmly. That is why we need to grow plants and plants help in preventing soil erosion. Soil erosion is adhering the soil particles, the roots adhering the soil particles, thereby preventing the loss of the top soil from the uh, uh, plants. So, uh, that is why we need to grow plants in order to prevent the soil erosion. Then, the pathway of movement of... So, when you understood that the root hairs are responsible for the absorption of water and from the root hairs, how the water is entering to the xylem vessels. Xylem vessels are seen here. So, let us try to understand the pathway of water from the root hairs to the xylem vessels. So here, the pathway is of three types. So the first pathway is the hypoplastic pathway. Yes. Nice. 
because of having the cascadian strips in the endodermis, this apoplastic pathway is blocked and again it has to join the other pathway in entering into the endodermis. So this, this is the only problem in apoplastic pathway. So it will be moving through the cell walls and the intercellular spaces and will not allow inside the cell. That is the mean. The molecules will not allow into the will not uh, uh, enter into the cell consistency and they move outside the cell and the and the intercellular spaces. Then the second pathway is. Second pathway is symplastic pathway. Symplastic pathway helps to move the helps in moving, moving the molecules from one cell to another cell through plasmodesmata. So the plant cells are connected to other cells through plasmodesmata. You can see these are the connections through which So this is the plasmodesmata. Plasma desmeter connect one cell to another cell. These are the cytoplasmic strands that gets connected through the cell walls. So now the simplistic pathway is movement of the molecules from one cell to another cell. In which the molecules enter inside the cell components and they are passed on from one cell to another cell through the plasma desmeter to the other cells. So, and this is the uh, suitable, the best pathway wherein the uh, water and the uh, mineral salt, dissolved mineral salts can reach the xylem results from the root sheets. And the third pathway is transmembrane pathway. Transmembrane pathway, it, it enters from one cell, it enters from one cell to the cell, that means it crosses all the membranes. It enters into the one membrane and it exits out into another membrane, then again it enters into another cell and it exits out from the cell. So it Give the molecules enter and exit, that means it crosses the membrane of one cell twice and enters into another cell, that is called as a transmembrane pathway. Out of these three pathways, simplest pathway is the efficient pathway where the water molecules and the dissolved mineral salts are transported from one cell to another cell, from the root heads to the xylem vessels inside. So in the next session, we are, we, we are going to understand about the uh, uh, technicalities of, uh, and the formulae that are used in the uh, transportation of water uh, and also we understand about the various uh, mechanisms and uh, we also try to understand about the various theories that support the movement of water uh, that is ascent of sap in plants and some of the theories, they object to uh, um, theories already proposed. So we will try to understand about all these components in the next session. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Visit us at needbook.in.